Yeah. All right. Well, it's 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Vancouver time, 5.30 p.m. Newfoundland time. And uh, that means we're on to the last, the fifth and the final uh, presentation for the CSEE Excellence in PhD Research Award talk. Um, we've had four incredible presenters, and four amazing presentations, and I am super excited uh, to have Ken Thompson here, who is the, uh, the final winner um, and who will be giving today's talk. And so I'm sure if any of you are watching that have seen the last talks, you'll know kind of the format, but Ken will give a 30 minute research talk Afterwards, there will be a live question and answer period. And so if you're watching and you have questions uh, throughout the talk or at the end of the talk or even right now, um, you can put them into the chat on the side of the stream. And I will go through them at the end of the talk and ask Ken these questions directly. Um, so feel free to pop questions in there at any time. Uh, before we get going, I'm going to pass it over to Ken to let him introduce himself in a second. But before I do that, I just want to give a plug out to the CSE elections that are going on. If you're a member of the CSE, then you should have received a ballot for your uh, for the election in your email. So double check that. And there are a lot of uh, really excellent candidates up running for the CSE Council, and um, you can find their platforms on the website as well. So check that out if you haven't done so already. Um, and the other thing I want to plug is that next week we'll have the Early Career Award talks, same time, same place. Um, stay tuned to the YouTube and our Twitter for more information about that. But we'll have two amazing back-to-back -back presentations uh, from some excellent researchers as well that have won our early career awards. Um, so stay tuned for those. If you've enjoyed these PhD award talks, then you're going to love the early career award talks as well. So all that said, uh, I, like I said, I'm really excited to have Ken here. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and then we'll share his uh, presentation. Well, cool. thank you, Peter. Um, and yeah, so my name is uh, Ken Thompson. Um, uh, thanks to you, Peter, and thanks to all the judges and everything for facilitating this whole competition. Uh, I, I have experienced very choppy internet in the past little bit by on Zoom calls. I elected to pre-record uh, my talk, but I'll be here after for um, to answer some questions. Uh, I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student at UBC. Is that right? Yeah, fourth year. Uh, I've got about a year and a half Left, uh, I work with Dolph Schluter on, on mechaniz mechanisms of adaptation and speciation. Uh, my PhD has been a mix of theory, sort of collecting my own data and sticklebacks um, and uh, synthesizing other people's data to try to figure out how things work out there in the real world. And, and uh, so for the talk today, I'm gonna talk exclusively just about, about other people's data that I've sort of uh, put together with some help and uh, try to make some inferences about patterns and. Uh, processes that might be important for speciation and hybridization. Um, so that's all I will say. I will uh, mute and stop my video and uh, see you again in 25 to 30 minutes. Thank you, Ken. Um, I think everyone can see the screen now. Yep. Okay, perfect. So we are going to start the talk right now. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ken Thompson. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of British Columbia, uh, working with Dolph Schluter. Uh, and before I begin, I just want to um, say thanks very much to, to Peter uh, and the rest of the CSE Council for facilitating this process um, for this award, which I'm really grateful to receive. Um, and also, uh, thank you to all the judges who spent all that time in British Columbia um, uh, evaluating all Dolph the Schluter. It sounds like a ton of work. Uh, and before I, I begin, I just want to um, say thanks very much to, to Peter uh, and the rest and of so the CSE Council what I want to talk about today this process is uh, a major award, part of my PhD, which I'm really grateful to receive. understand patterns um, of and also uh, thank you to all the judges uh, who spent all that time in British Columbia evaluating all the Schluter species crosses. Um, and so really trying to understand what hybrids look like, behave like, smell like, and so on and so forth. Um, also looking at whether we can predict the phenotypic expression of a hybrid given the characteristics of its parents, um, and trying to understand a little bit about how the traits expressed in hybrids might uh, affect their uh, ultimate fitness in the field. And so this project was done in collaboration with Mackenzie Urgert Kronisch, Ken Whitney, Lauren Riesberg, uh, and Dolph Schluter. And I want to begin with a quote 
by Ronald Fisher, um, which he made in his 1930 book, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. The quote is, the grossest blunder which we can conceive of an animal making would be to mate with a species different from its own and with which the hybrids, the mixture of instincts and other attributes, are at so serious a disadvantage as to leave no descendants. And the part of the quote that I want to draw your attention to is the mixture of instincts and other attributes. And that's because there are many possible meanings of this. And we actually have a very poor understanding of how traits that differentiate species come together and are expressed in hybrids and what that means for how the hybrids perform in the field. And so I just want to explain kind of the concepts underlying the different outcomes of hybridization using the example of an ichneumonid uh, wasp with two traits, ovipositor length and uh, behavioral preference for uh, oviposition site. And so let's imagine one species that has a long ovipositor and a behavioral preference for wide logs. And so the ovipositor is this little thing on the back of it there. And let's imagine a sister species, which has a short ovipositor and a behavioral preference for narrow logs. Now let's just imagine that these two species come together and hybridize. One possible outcome of hybridization is mismatch, where the traits of the different parents are expressed in a weird combination due to dominance in different directions in the hybrid. And so we can imagine a hybrid with a short ovipositor, for example, and a behavioral preference for wide logs. And you know, this might not be good because the hybrid would not be able to um, reach the larvae that are deeply embedded in these wide logs with its short ovipositor. And that would presumably reduce its fitness. And we actually know some things about mismatching hybrids. So uh, in this uh, great paper in 1993, uh, Lauren Riesberg and Norm Elstrand surveyed the literature and found that hybrids are a mosaic of both parental and intermediate morphological characters rather than just intermediate ones. And the, the, this was a really good study, but it was 1993, and so there was, weren't a lot of data available, uh, nor as much computational power. And so the problems with this earlier study, which, which uh, make it worth following up on, are that this study wasn't quantitative, so it was really just tallying up whether a trait was intermediate versus uh, parental. It was only in plants, and so we don't actually really know is this plant specific or not. And it was also almost entirely in domesticated species. And this is particularly important because when we're domesticating crops or horticultural species, we might actually select four dominant mutations because we notice them, or we might purge out the alternative allele and just make select for recessive um, alleles. And we know this happens a lot. Uh, in, in both animal and plant domestication. And so whether or not these results pertain to species in a state of nature is unclear. So we talked about mismatch. The other interpretation of a mixture of instincts and other attributes is what you might have if you're a speciation biologist and you study uh, um, so-called extrinsic reproductive isolation. And so I want to just emphasize two, two quotes from uh, important books on speciation that I think accurately summarize what the field historically and kind of still thinks about trait expression in hybrids. So Coin and Orr, probably the most influential book on speciation, 2004, I mean, the most modern book. Hybrids might present an intermediate courtship behavior or other phenotype that renders them unfit. And uh, Patrick Nossel in his book, Ecological Speciation, 2012, says basically hybrids are intermediate and fall between parental niches. And so Oh yeah, I should say, this is kind of also what you might come away with if you're a fish biologist. Um, Carl Hubbs famously, I think it was 1955, said that it's a general rule that fish hybrids are always exactly intermediate between the parent species. Um, and what they all mean by this really is just that the hybrids have intermediate values for all traits that differentiate the parents. So they have a medium length ovipositor and a behavioral preference for medium logs. And in my opinion, differentiating between these two outcomes is really important because it tells us about the sorts of genetic architectures that are likely to underlie reproductive isolation in the field. If it really is just intermediate traits that render hybrids unfit, then probably the main genetic architecture of uh, so-called extrinsic selection against hybrids is just heterozygous disadvantage. Um, individuals that are heterozygous for divergent alleles do worse than individuals that have either uh, homozygous genotype. But if mismatch is really pronounced, then actually what that would suggest is that interactions among divergent genes are really important for um, differentiating species, which would suggest that hybrid incompatibilities might be the main genetic basis of ecology-based reproductive isolation. And so in my talk today, I'm going to address three questions. 
Um, the first question is to what degree are first generation hybrids phenotypically intermediate versus mismatched? And this is really just pattern documentation, synthesizing the literature of the, of the, on the topic quantitatively and saying, what is the state of things? The second is what are the fitness consequences of intermediacy and mismatch? And this uh, will involve a field experiment with uh, recombinant hybrid sunflowers. And third, is mismatch greatest immediately after hybridization or does it increase after segregation and recombination in backcross or F2 hybrids? This last part is uh, fairly preliminary, I will warn you, um, but I think is exciting. Okay, and so for the first question, to what degree are, hybrid, uh, are first generation hybrids phenotypically intermediate versus mismatched? This involves a systematic literature review. Um, in total, we obtained data from nearly 200 studies, and I won't go too much into the details here, but you can ask if you, if you want more. Um, just collected trait mean, standard deviation, and sample size data for parents and their F1 hybrids. Um, the, importantly, vascular plants, insects, and vertebrates are all, all well represented, each making up about a third of the total studies with some weird stuff in there like seaweeds and and these are all quantitative traits in non-domesticated taxa. Um, and so these are not traits like survival um, and, and, and things like that. And they're also not traits that are fitness components, typically. Um, and so there's no traits like pollen viability or herbivore resistance or something like that. These are really just traits like, you know, limb length and um, uh, body, body size and, and things like that. Um, and that, and so these types of traits are often called something like non-fitness traits or ordinary traits, quote unquote. Okay, so question one, to what degree are first generation hybrids phenotypically intermediate versus mismatch? And so I just wanna start by going over the basic quantitative geometric framework um, that we use to quantify our dominance metrics. What we do is we look at pairs of traits at a time so in this case, the x-axis trait one, the y-axis is trait two. And we scale the parents so that parent one is zero, zero, and parent two is one, one. And then we just ask, where does the F1 fall in this geometric space? And so in this case, it's a phenotype for trait one is a little closer to parent one, um, or quite a bit closer uh, to parent one, and it's uh, phenotype for trait two is a little bit closer to parent two. What we do then is we project that hybrid's phenotype onto the line that connects the parent phenotypes. And we use this basic projection to calculate two quantities of interest. The first one um, is the uh, parent bias dominance, and so it's the distance from the parental midpoint to that where that projection uh, intersects with the line connecting the parents. Um, this tells you how much closer overall the hybrid is to one parent compared to the other. The next is the distance from the hybrid to the line facing the parent. This is what we're calling the mismatch dominance, D mismatch. Um, so in this case, this hybrid might have a mismatch value of around 0.5 and a parent bias value of around 0.25. So it's about 50% as mismatched as it can be without sort of exceeding the parental range or being transgressive. Um, and it's about a quarter of the way between intermediate and parent one. You can imagine a case where the hybrid is exactly intermediate between the parents, in which case both of these dominance metrics would be zero. You can imagine a case where both traits are dominant for parent one, in, in which case the parent bias is one, so it's completely the same as one parent and the mismatch is zero. You can also imagine a case where trait one is completely dominant for parent one and trait two is completely dominant for parent two. In this case, the parent bias would be zero because the hybrid resembles both parents equally but the mismatch dominance is one because it's as mismatched as it can be without transgressing that parental range. Okay, so I'm gonna first talk about the dominance of individual traits considered on their own. So not looking at um, trait pairs at a time, but individual traits one at a time. Uh, and I'm gonna just simply, for all the traits that were measured in a cross, um, calculate the dominance and um, take the average, so one, so each cross contributes one value uh, for this uh, metric of cross mean univariate dominance, uh, and there's 233 unique crosses in the data set. And just to go over what the numbers mean, so this is gonna be a, just a density plot, it's like a histogram, but smoother. Um, the value of zero means that the hybrids um, are exactly intermediate between the two parents for individual traits. Uh, value of one means that the traits are uh, parental, so they resemble one parent or the other, regardless of the direction. 
and values greater than one mean that they are transgressive. And so here's what the distribution of the data look like. And so we see the mean is about uh, is 0.79 and the median is uh, 0.55. And so what this means is that for individual traits, uh, hybrids are typically not intermediate, but rather halfway between intermediate and parental, um, which is, you know, to me, quite a surprisingly high degree of dominance. The next result um, is for pairs of traits at a time. So it's a 2D metric um, that we're calling, uh, we call parent bias. Um, and so the numbers mean the same thing, um, except for it's, you know, sort of a bivariate direction this time, not just for single traits. Uh, a value of zero means that um, the hybrids are, resemble the two parents equally, and a value of one means that the hybrids resemble one parent um, completely without being transgressive. Values greater than one are transgressive. And so here's what the distribution of the data look like. And I should say there's 165 crosses um, that contribute data here because they each have to measure two or more traits. Uh, and the mean is uh, 0.68 and the median is about 0.44. And so it's a pretty similar interpretation to the previous graph. So hybrids aren't actually exactly intermediate um, between the parents when you look at a given pair of traits, but actually they resemble one parent about 50% more than the other. And the last one, and you know, the one that I'm a little bit biased in saying I think is the most interesting uh, is mismatch dominance. And so the numbers mean the same thing, uh, zero, that it means that the hybrid is right on that line that we showed earlier connecting the two parents together. So not mismatched at all. The value of one hybrid would be right in the corner of that earlier graph. So as mismatched as it could be without being transgressive and values greater than that, uh, transgressive. And so here's what the distribution of these values look like. And so the mean is about 0.6 and the median is about 0.31. So uh, depending if you want to look at the mean or the median, you could say that the average hybrid is more than halfway between, um, more than half as mismatched as is maximally possible without being transgressive, and the median hybrid is about a, a third as mismatched as is maximally possible without being transgressive. And so I think a, a fairly moderate degree of mismatch was what we see. And so just to wrap up what I've told you so far, um, the dominance of individual traits um, we see is quite substantial. So hybrids aren't intermediate, but rather more than halfway between intermediate uh, and parental. Uh, this causes F1 hybrids to be quite mismatched and also biased toward one parent more than the other when you look at a given pair of traits at a time. And just some notes that um, might address some lingering questions that you have. We see no effect of genetic distance on any metric of dominance or transgression. We did this a few ways. We compared the outcome of intraspecific within species and interspecific uh, between species crosses, and there's no difference. We calculated genetic divergence from nucleotide sequence data. There's no relationship. Um, and we also uh, used uh, the website TimeTree to estimate the divergence time in years, and there's also no relationship between divergence time and dominance. There's no phylogenetic signal suggesting that plants, animals, and insects, there's no major differences in dominance um, between them. There's some evidence of maternal bias, uh, so about 57% of traits are biased toward mom, uh, and we can um, get this information from crosses that were conducted both ways. So some cross, sometimes the one species was the mom, and sometimes and the other one was the dad. Sometimes that second species was the mom, and the first one was the dad. Um, and it's important to also say that um, these values could potentially be caused by sampling error, and so what we wanted to do was just get a sense of what the values we would expect under a pure sampling error regime was. And so we did some pretty simple simulations uh, to un understand sort of the null distribution of these values by sampling error. And we see that the values that we observe from the real data are all over three times greater than what we expect from sampling error. Um, and so this suggests that the majority of the signal that we're seeing is caused by real biology. So real effects of genes, um, you know, balancing each other out. Okay, and so for the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the fitness consequences of intermediacy and mismatch. And so to test for the fitness consequences of intermediacy and mismatch, um, we have to measure fitness, uh, fitness component and traits in the field. And we require variation in mismatch and parent bias, which is what we would put on you know, the x-axis in our ideal test, and fitness, which is what we put on the y-axis in, in our ideal test. 
The problem with the previous data set is that testing the fitness consequences is essentially impossible because within a given study, all the hybrids are heterozygous and they all kind of more or less resemble one another. Uh, and so there's not actually a ton of variation in mismatch or parent bias within a, within a study. And comparing comparisons across studies would have unclear meaning because of different traits and different fitness components. And so what we want to do actually is look at recombinant, so F2 or backprots hybrids that are planted in a common garden alongside their parents because in this setting, there's a lot of among individual variation in mismatch and in parent bias uh, that we can use to try to understand in a, in a given field site how these different trade, types of trade interactions affect fitness. And the credit for this idea really has to go to Ken Whitney from the University of New Mexico. Um, I was at a hybridization meeting in Hamburg where I met Ken and I was talking and my, I had a poster about the results that I showed in the first half of uh, this talk. And Ken came up to me um, kind of after the conference and he said, hey, I have this great data set, I think that would be perfect for testing whether these types of trade interactions actually do affect fitness in the ways that you might expect. And so uh, Ken was a really big part of getting the second part of the study uh, off the ground. And so what we did is we took advantage of data from a uh, large common garden planting of sunflowers. And so these are, this is a garden of um, Helianthus annuus and Helianthus debilis, first generation back cross hybrids. Um, Ken measured uh, many traits. We're going to talk about 20 here because those are the ones that were different between the parents. Um, morphology, life history, ecophysiological, lots of you know, plant traits like water use efficiency and specific leaf area, um, flowering time, that sort of thing. There's approximately 500 hybrids, uh, about 475, and about 50 of each parent species um, that were grown in the same site. Um, and that's, this was replicated twice uh, at two sites near Austin, Texas. Uh, we see the same patterns at both, so I'm just going to show you one. Um, and we quantified uh, uh, pairwise parent bias, pairwise mismatch, and fitness, but which was seed count in this case, um, in essentially the exact same way that we did in the first half of the study, so the metrics are directly comparable. Okay, and so I'm going to go over the results here, and first I'll explain what these graphs mean. So on the x-axis is the mean uh, pairwise uh, parent bias on the top and mean pairwise mismatch on the bottom. Uh, and on the y-axis is seed count uh, and just note the log-log scale. Um, and each point that will be on these graphs is an individual sunflower. Okay, and so for mean pairwise parent bias, what we see is a positive relationship uh, between uh, parent bias and seed count. And so for each unit increase in parent bias, we see that these plants produce approximately 2,000 more seeds. Uh, so what this means is that individuals where more of their trait pairs are sort of aligned in the same direction, they do better. Now let's look at mismatch. What we see in this case is a negative relationship between an individual's mean pairwise uh, mismatch and seed count. Um, so for each unit increase in mismatch, individuals produce uh, about 3,700 fewer seeds. Uh, and so what this means is that individuals who have uh, a greater magnitude of mismatch in more pairs of traits do worse than individuals that are less mismatch. And so I think it's informative now to just look at the regression coefficients, essentially the slopes of the lines. And if we do a very simple linear hypothesis test where we ask, do these two metrics of dominance have uh, the same magnitude of an effect on fitness in this common garden, we see that they do not. Actually, we can say that this, the magnitude of mismatch being twice as strong in this common garden is a significant difference between the effect size of these two metrics. And so it seems that mismatch is more important for fitness in these sunflowers um, than parent bias. And so I think there's reasons to be excited about these results and maybe this is the, a general pattern that affects hybrid fitness in the field. But, um, I'm cautious to get too excited and too optimistic based on this one common garden uh, in this one species. And so I think the, the obvious next step uh, in this line of research is to try to assemble as much data uh, as we can, conduct our own experiments as well, um, to try to understand how general these patterns are. And so we're launching a 
synthesis uh, of fitness effects of mismatch and parent bias. But to do this, we need data. Um, and so if you or listener uh, or anybody else have data uh, where you have recombinant hybrids that are, you know, if they're plants grown in a common garden, if they're fish, you put them in the same pond where you measured at least two traits on individuals. Um, so if you have this data or you know of it, uh, and ideally you'd know the parent phenotypes from the same environment, or at least you know um, your sort of representative phenotypes for the different parent species, um, and you measured a fitness component. If you have data like this, I would be really excited to hear from you um, because I think it'd be great to work together on with somebody who knows the system pretty well. Okay, so the third thing in, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about is trying to answer the question of whether mismatch is substantial immediately after hybridization as compared to uh, further generations, so back crosses and F2s. Um, and this might be the case because in back crosses and F2s, you have recombination and, and segregation that can sort of break up all sorts of weird trait correlations and lead to hybrids that might have, uh, on average, you know, substantially more extreme trait combinations than what you observe in the F1s that are, uh, uh, you know, all heterozygous for the divergent genes, divergent alleles. Um, and I just want to say that this is quite preliminary and ongoing. Um, and so uh, things might change the next time that you see this. Um, and this particular project was really motivated um, by this, kind of motivated but entirely by this one figure that was uh, published by Brad Sean Shemsky in 1989, um, where um, on the top row you have on the left Mimulus lewisii, on the right Mimulus cardinalis, and in the middle their F1 hybrid. Um, and if you look at that F1, it you know it looks a little bit more pink than red, but the flower petals look a little bit more curved than um, uh, than than straight. Um, and there's other sorts of traits that are you know harder to see, like the nectar and things like that. Um, and so, so as we saw before, the F1s are quite mismatched. But if you look at the F2s, actually, there's, you know, in the bottom left and the bottom right, there's some F2 individuals that look almost exactly like uh, one of the parents. But then there's some that look totally bizarre, like they look like a um, cardinalis, but they have a really mismatched uh, color. They have a Lucii color or vice versa. They just have all sorts of weird and bizarre combinations that probably would not work uh, whatsoever. Um, and so I was interested in, in initially in looking at this data set and seeing how the, the average mismatch of an F2 compares to the average mismatch of an F1. And so I'm just going to show you, I got the data from, from uh, Toby Bradshaw, who responded almost immediately to my data request, which was nice. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you is the mean pairwise mismatch, so looking at across all the pairs of traits um, for the F1s, and the F2s. And the values mean the exact same thing as they did before, where zero means that the hybrids are sort of exactly on that line that's connecting the parents, so not mismatched. And one means that they're in the corner of those, the mismatch distribution, so as mismatched as they can be without being transgressive. And greater than one means that they have some a transgressive uh, mismatch value. And here's what the, uh, the data look like. Um, so there's a pretty substantial degree of mismatch. As expected, the F2s have more variation in mismatch um, than the F1s. But actually, if you do a simple t-test on these data, actually the F1s on average are slightly more mismatched than the F2s, which was um, kind of counterintuitive to me uh, at first. Um, and so uh, I wanted to see if this sort of pattern is general or whether this particular study is a, is a bit of an outlier. Um, and so what I'm doing again is another systematic literature review. I've, I've got data from about 30 studies now and counting. I'm hoping to, I've identified about 70 or 80 studies where I can get data. Um, unfortunately, you know, most people are locked out of their labs and can't get to their uh, data right now. So things are going a little slower than I originally intended, but that's fine. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm collecting individual level phenotype data for individual F1s and F2s or, or back crosses. Um, and so in the first data set, I really only had cross means. And so this is a, a greatly expanded um, data set. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's very similar to questions one and two, except it's just comparing among cross generations within a single study. Um, and so this is taking the form of a, of a meta-analysis. Um, and so I'm going to show just the basic forest plot here. Um, so on the x-axis is the difference in mismatch between uh, the F F2s and F1s, uh, plus or minus standard error. Um, and so, uh, and on the y-axis, it's all the different studies that I've got so far. Um, and so the, the vertical line, the dashed line is at zero. On the right of that line, it means that the F2s are more mismatched. 
uh, and on the um, left of that line, the F1s are more mismatched. And so that study that we just saw, the Bradshaw study, is going to be on the left of that line. And so preliminary, but here's what the results look like overall. And so what you can kind of see is that it's kind of around around the middle, but there's more studies that are to the right of the line a little bit than left of the line. And if you um, take, if you ask, you know, is the mean difference uh, in a random effects meta-analysis different from uh, zero, you get a, uh, an answer of yes, uh, about 0 0.041 units different. Um, you can do the same thing in back crosses, and so this is the exact same type of data, except it's comparing back crosses to uh, F1s. Right of the zero is back crosses are more mismatched. Left of the zero um, uh, is that the F1s are more mismatched, um, and we get uh, a virtually an identical answer. So um, the back crosses are, on average, about 0.48 units more mismatched than uh, F1s, and the back cross mismatch at this time does not differ from the F2 mismatch. And so if you just look at sort of an effect size, it seems that back crosses in um, F2s are about 20% more mismatched than um, F1s of the same hybrid type, um, which, you know, tells me actually that mismatch is pretty close to what its maximum strength is as soon as things start hybridizing. And so um, it's not necessarily the case that this is only a mechanism that, um, is greatly important uh, after recombination and segregation has happened. Um, and there's tons of variation among studies, and so I would not really uh, have any confidence about the outcome of any individual cross until I looked at it. Um, and so far, this is uh, based on about 12,000 individual hybrids, but as I said, there's a lot more data to collect. And so uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I, uh, thanks again for the organizers and the judges for, uh, going through this process and I'm looking forward to answering any questions if there are any. Thanks. Okay. Hello everybody. Uh, my name. Hello everybody. My name, that's me live. There we go. Thank you, Ken. Amazing talk. Um, Peter. worked very well pre-recorded. Apologize to the audience members. There was a slight audio hiccup at one point, but that was fixed very quickly. Um, so thank you, Ken. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, we have already a few questions kind of pouring in, so I'll jump to those now. Um, as a reminder to all the viewers, if you have any more questions for Ken, uh, type them into the chat and I'll relate them to him. But we'll start off with the first one. Um, someone is asking about, they said, first of all, excellent review on hybrids. Um, for hybrid versus mid-parent trait value and looking at dominance, did you consider things such as how trait size might scale differently with linear area or volume measurements? Yeah, so um, when I was collecting the data, I categorized every trait as uh, like scaling with scaling in three dimensions, two dimensions, or one dimension. Um, and then when I was putting everything together, I found that, and I think, you know, things like counts as well. I found that those scaling factors, you know, maybe surprisingly didn't actually affect the dominance patterns. So things like ma body mass versus body length seem to be inherited in much the, the same way. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of applause uh, pouring in, just wanna let you know. A lot of great talks, a lot of uh, great presentations. So, awesome job. Um, and then follow-up question, or kind of continuing on that, I guess. Um, so, uh, the same questioner, sorry, I should have read the whole thing, but they're wondering, so this could cause F1s to be quite different than the mid-parent if the genetic value is determined on one scale. For example, if genes control width, um, but you measure it on another, for example, volume. Um, so I guess you find it kind of touched on this already in your answer, but do you want to um, add anything else uh, given that? Yeah, so I can, I can also say that like maybe if that was the case, you'd often expect the bias and the dominance toward the larger parent value if there was some weird scaling thing happening. And it seems actually that there's no tendency for the hybrids to resemble the, the individual parent with a larger trait value. And that could be like body mass. That could be like the pigment concentration or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, when I, looked, when I looked at these things, when I was collecting the data, it didn't really seem, nothing I, nothing I put in there could really predict dominance. It really just, it really seems to me like the best way to describe it is kind of idiosyncratic. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I, I'm pretty sure I did as deep of a dive on that as I could have, but 
um, I, I'll take an, I'll take another look to see if I'm forgetting something. No, sounds great. Sounds like it was already a wild amount of work. So, uh, so things out there. Um, another question coming in uh, for the first part with the literary review. Um, you said the traits are not fitness components. Um, the questioner may have missed some information, but what are these traits? Physiological, morphological, et cetera? Yeah, so the way I like, the way, there's a lot of subject, subjectivity here. Uh, and the way that I would categorize kind of traits, and I mean, it's not, nothing's perfect. There are definitely, I, there were some traits that were ambiguous and I coded them as, as such in the, in the database. Um, so a trait that is like, it's always better to, to be, to have a higher value or a lower value I consider a fitness trait, so like survival, like it's always better to survive than, than not survive, like all, all is being equal. Um, a lot of the times it was the authors interpreting this, like sterility, you know, that's kind of what I, like herbivore resistance, those types of traits, it's kind of, there's kind of a qualitative value associated with any direction of the, of the trait values. So those ones I kind of discarded, but you can imagine something like, um, uh, like in the stickleback system that I work on, there's these traits called gill rakers that act like a comb to filter out uh, food when the fish are feeding. Um, some species have many, some species have few. Uh, it just depends on what you're eating, whether few or many are good or bad. Um, if, you're filter if, you have, if you're eating large prey, then you want few. If you're eating small prey, then you want many. Um, and so it, it's, more, it's more traits like that where um, they're not under selection to get bigger universally, it's kind of divergent selection between populations and stabilizing selection within populations. But like I said, it's not perfect. And I did code some traits as like potentially ambiguous. So like a lot of studies like body size, it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, yeah. Okay. And I guess with regards to those different categories and stuff, did you find differences between those or? Um... So no. So, um, so the, there, yeah, the different categories are like behavior, um, life history, uh, pigments, morphology, um, Kemp and uh, is one other one I'm forgetting. Um, everything seemed like super noisy and like everything seemed the same. There was, there was one only chemical traits, which are like the concentration of particular pheromones and like the wings of a butterfly, uh, seemed to have like extreme dominance values. But those ones are also studies that they were very that was the least well represented trait type in the analysis. And those are also studies that typically measure like a ton of traits. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not. I think if you collected more data, maybe it wouldn't stand out, but I, I think so it's just kind of sampling error, but behavior, morphology, life history, all seems kind of to play by similar idiosyncratic rules. Interesting, yeah. Um, another question in, does the fact that mismatch declines with F1 and F2, et cetera, tell you something about the strength of DMIs, uh, epistasis versus under dominance? or dominance in hybrids? Yeah, so I think I think it's a productive, so DMIs are just, most people think about them as uh, interactions between different genes that cause hybrids to die. Um, and this is this is kind of a, it was a big thing in speciation because it was it's a mechanism when you look at two different genes at the same time, it's kind of unclear when you look at, if you looked at one gene or one locus, how you could get intermediates when they all if how intermediates would all die, like how would how would you ever go from one state to the other state if everything in the middle died? Um, and so DMIs are just interactions among different genes that particular combinations produce hybrids. Uh, I think a, a good way to think about DMIs in a lot of systems like I studied are just that the strength of selection on DMIs it can be caused by mis mismatched trait combinations. Um, caused by it, it is interactions between different loci, but it's caused by the dominance in different directions at those different loci. Um, you know, one toward parent A, one's dominant toward parent B. Um, you probably see a pretty similar, you see probably a predictable pattern of selection in an F2. Um, I think probably these types of things are really strong in, in F1s when you measure them in the field. And I think a lot of people don't study hybrid incompatibilities in the field, they study them in the lab. Uh, I think these types of hybrid compatibilities could evolve really fast, um, but I think they're probably individually a lot weaker than the types of DMIs that we study now that like kill hybrids. Um, so probably a lot harder to do things like genetic mapping of incompatibilities with these types of things. But I mean, I, I, I'm kind of a bit of a radical and I think most of the genes that underlie divergently selected traits are probably incompatible in hybrids. So probably most of the genomes are incompatible and you'll just never be able to pinpoint the individual genes because they're really small effect. 
Is that something with more and more kind of uh, as technology advances, we're better able to measure these things? Do you think that could be something that can be tested? I think probably. I think what you'd need is really high powered experiments and you'd need to sequence a lot of individuals. So I think, you know, like if there's 10 genes that underlie go rakers or something like that, there's probably 50. You knock out one of those or you change, you convert the one to the other value. The fitness effect is probably super small. It's probably like 0 0.002 selection coefficient or something like that. And so as, so you, you really just need, I think you, you'd need to se just sequence a ton of individuals and um, you can probably detect it. I just, I think there's coarser approaches that I won't get into too much that can be more useful. Um, but yeah, you could, you could do some tests. You just need a lot of, a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. Another PhD. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question here. Um, they wonder if you have different ploidy levels in the data sets you look at. Uh, for example, sunflowers have high ploidy data sets, uh, have high ploidy. Um, and could that be related to transgressive phenotypes? Yeah, so there's there's two things there. There's like so there's, there's tons of differences among base chromosome number among different studies, and there's also differences in like some studies cross polyploids to diploids, for example. Um, and so I just I had too few polyploidy crosses, so there's like you know tetraploid cross to a diploid and things like that. Too few to really draw any meaningful inferences. I, I was having a really I, I like a year ago I tried to find a database on like somatic or whatever it's called a chromosome number. So like humans are 23, what's it for these other species? Monkey flowers are like 10 or something. And I was having a really hard time doing that in an efficient way. And so I just kind of dropped it. I think it's a good, it's a good thing to look into. Um, I don't know what you'd expect, but maybe more chromosomes, more additivity, I'm not sure. But yeah, it's just something I should revisit. I should try to put a more effort in scraping some data like that. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of different avenues uh, from this project too, eh? Yeah. Too many. <laughs> I had a, so I had a question. Um, I was wondering, this is a little out of my wheelhouse as a more of an ecologist. So I was wondering kind of in the greater, I guess at a, a higher level, kind of what are the consequences for speciation or understanding of it um, from yeah. this? Yeah. To me, to me, like one of the most interesting questions about speciation is why it happens. Like what, what is the reason that we have so many different species and understanding the genetic architecture, the way that the genes of different species interact to cause the process of speciation to progress is interesting to me. Um, and it, so it's really just trying to understand at a deeper level why speciation happens. And I think um, trying to understand, you know, if not for mismatch, how many fewer species would there be, is a, it would be interesting to know. Um, it's more just trying to understand, just, you know, add a, to have a perspective of the varying, the relative importance of different processes. It's, it's definitely not the case that this causes all speciation, um, but you know, how important is it? Just, just to me, it's, it's interesting and I'm glad I get to work on it. Yeah, no, it definitely came off really cool. Um, wildly good talk. Uh, awesome. A lot of, uh, I think you answered the questions very well as well. People have said uh, they were really happy with that. Uh, we're really satisfied with the answers you had there. Um, another question here, uh, there ought to be selection against mismatch individuals within polymorphic populations too. Are there many examples? Um, is it a kind of correlational selection? I mean, so cor correlational selection is really just, just to define that it's when two traits, um, it's, to, it's when two traits have an optimal value that when in particular configurations together, a famous example is in like these garter snakes that have particular behaviors and particular patterns that if you have a mismatch, they don't look very well disguised. And if you have the right behaviors with the right patterns then you look better, you're better disguised. Um, this is kind of the same thing. I just think with different units that are more intuitive to interpret because correlational selection really is just like an interaction term and a regression. Um, and so it's a little bit trickier to interpret. And I think these units are a little bit more uh, so what was the first part of the question, Peter? Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, are there, I guess, are there many examples of selection oh, against mismatch individuals within polymorphic populations? Um, so polymorphic is when you have like two morphs talking to get, or like um, coexisting together. I actually don't know. I, I bet if people look, there would be like 
I can imagine like, you know, the famous, one of the famous polymorphisms is these peppered moths where you have the white ones and the, and the darker ones. I can imagine like, so that's a famous color polymorphism. I can imagine if there was like some behavioral attunement to like always go to, uh, you know, dark trees or white trees, like if, you know, or something like that, um, that could be mismatched with the polymorphism. Um, the, they're like, the, mo the most famous thing, or I don't know, it's a lot of, uh, there's some examples qualitatively linking host plant choice and insects to mismatch. No one's ever really measured the fitness consequences of that, but it's kind of like the, kind of like what I talked about in the beginning of the talk, like the, the insect hybrids are physiologically attuned to feed on one plant, but behaviorally attuned to, you know, go to the other one. Um, that's not, that's not really a polymorphism. It's kind of continuous it would definitely be easier to study in a polymorphism if you could find one. Um, I bet it would be there if you looked. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, really great. Really great. Um, we terrific done? talk. Yeah. I think we're, I think we're good. We're going to awesome. let you pass the gauntlet now. Uh, terrific talk though. Congratulations on the award and congratulations as well to the four uh, previous presenters and, and your co-winners of the CSE Excellence in PhD Award research talk. I've, I've had the pleasure of sitting through all five talks and I can say without a doubt, they were all incredible presentations and I'm really so impressed with you guys. So happy I get to sit here every Friday and listen to these. So, so congratulations, Ken. Yeah, thanks to you, Peter. I know this is def definitely, you know, from having organized this similar thing last year, it seems like you had to do a lot more work than, than I did. <laughs> and so uh, thank you for taking it on um, in spite of not having a meeting. So it's a uh, yeah it's good it's good that you were keen to take on this you know extra extra burden to get the research out there during the shutdown so thank you appreciate it appreciate it yeah uh, and thank you for everyone tuning in um thank you for watching uh, especially if you've watched more than one uh, i hope you really enjoyed it uh, as much as i did um as a reminder next week we have the two early career researcher talks um that will be going on back to back uh, same time, Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Vancouver time, 5.30 Newfoundland time. Um, so if you've enjoyed listening to science on that Friday afternoon, um, then definitely tune into that next week. Um, on that note, thank you all again. Uh, congratulations to the winners. And uh, I'll see you all hopefully next week. Cheers.